All right. We're back. More Q&A. We have we've gotten through like one sheet. So, you know, getting there. Alan, Alan from Australia. You were also asking me about escape rooms. Uh, you said, do I ever participate in escape rooms? And do I enjoy escape rooms? Yes, uh, I do. Both of those questions are yes. Not as much as my wife. My wife, Tara, really likes escape rooms and tends to participate more enthusiastically than I do. But I'm grateful that she brings me along and she encourages me to join her and some of our friends. Uh, I think you also sort of asked, do you ever uh, use any of your skills? In a, and the answer is yes. Um, we try very hard to participate in the spirit of the escape room and not just the reality of it. But there are, there are a number of times when a certain lock mechanism or a certain puzzle can be more easily decoded than maybe the creators of the puzzle thought. Yeah, a lot of... Because let's face it, a lot of escape rooms, they puzzles work really well with combination-based locks. Things that either have a number or letter-based combination. Because you find the puzzle, you decode the clue, and then you get the thing and you open the block. And many times, off-the-shelf hardware that supports combinations is crappy. So I will very rapidly decode a lot of combination locks very quickly in escape rooms, and we inadvertently wind up uh, skipping some steps. Which leads quite nicely into a whole section we have here about locks and lock picking. So Pablo, Pablo from Yorkshire. A lot of people named Pablo in Yorkshire? I don't know. But Pablo from Yorkshire uh, asked a very similar question to MacNuts420, and I'm going to kind of blend these together and we'll, we'll talk about it. Pablo said, essentially, what do I think about the idea of a think tank of lockpicking experts? Uh, the idea of to drive the industry in better directions. Companies whose locks are not rated by this think tank would feel the pressure to uh, you know, up their standards of quality and participate in a rating system. And again, MacNutt said... Um, you know, the same thing, but speaking about gun, gun locks. Gun locks typically have abysmal standards. Uh, should we be legislating better practices? Should the industry have a reason for better practices? And unfortunately, there's a lot... Of, what's, what's my phrase, right? The world, as ever, is complicated. And there are a lot of competing forces at work in the kind of questions you're asking. So I will say that the world is not absent of examples like what you're saying, especially what Pablo mentions. So the idea of a separate, kind of an independent rating body. In America, we have this. I mean, we have the, the BHMA. We have the Builders Hardware and Manufacturers Association. We have ANSI standards. Uh, they're not worth a lot. Uh, many of those standards are based around duty cycle and re repetition of use and brute force, like how many foot-pounds of torque can they handle uh, before a, a bolt will break. You have Underwriters Lab, a little better. Underwriters Lab, um, they rate high-security locks, and they rate safes, but not everyday locks, of course. Uh, a really cool example actually comes from the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands has the SKG system. SKG, one-star, two-star, three-star these are police uh, are involved and independent insurance agents are involved in the development of these standards, my understanding is. And because it has to do with your insurance that you actually, your insurance rating is impacted based on what hardware you're using. Are you using an SKG two-star or three-star lock on your door? In America, we're not going to see that. We're never going to see a real think tank uh, of the, the nature that Pablo describes. We're not really going to see good gun locks. Uh, as MacNuts420 mentions, legislation, right? There are plenty of places that legislate you have to use a gun lock. And that's as far as the legislation takes it. Which, if you mandate, this is a, a famous government term, right? An unfunded mandate. If you mandate that people do a thing, but you don't provide any money for it, you are going to see compliance with the law in the most minimal bullshit way possible. 
and that's what we see with gun locks, right? It is the um, California Department of Justice that drives a lot of this standard. Uh, you'll see very frequently locks are listed as California DOJ approved because the California laws tend to be a little more uh, restrictive than most other parts of the country. My friend Dave, uh, my friend uh, Dave who runs handgunsaferesearch.com, and he has a whole bunch of videos and reviews and talks about a lot of things online. Most gun safety products, their design is not geared toward preventing like theft. It's geared toward, and I think this is the real problem, it's geared toward preventing like your toddler from having an accidental discharge into the carpet or God forbid into themselves. So most gun locks aren't really security devices. Most gun locks are safety devices. And likewise, a lot of locks we use, like a lot of hardware store locks, this is, I've talked about this online occasionally, and I promise I'm going to have a video where I mention how most of the hardware store locks that are out there are almost symbolic locks. They're not worthless, right? Like they are a lock. They're a deadbolt or a doorknob, but they are representing to the world hey, this is my private space and you don't belong in my private space. Do they actually offer a true barrier to entry? Most of the time, no. And that's insidious as a problem though because we don't have a lot of, like the Netherlands, the, the SKG system, right? Like we don't have a system like that in America. We don't have incentives to make locks better. And that's really where the market needs to address the deficiency. We don't incentivize the use of better locks. And I think Pablo and others are going to say, well, that's what I mean. There should be an independent body. Um, without dollars on the line, an independent body is like the Nintendo seal of quality. Once other third parties started making Nintendo cartridges that worked in the NES, nobody gave a shit if their cartridge had the Nintendo seal of quality on it, right? Uh, because there was no incentive. You didn't care. And unless there are real dollar incentives, either relating to insurance, um, which is, I like that as a solution because it's very private sector. You can choose to have insurance or not. Um, I don't like the idea of the police like mandating things because that's, again, you're going to get shitty compliance at lowest common denominator compliance. It's an insidious problem. And maybe we'll talk about it more in future videos. But as would there be a think tank of lock experts? Maybe. I mean, if it's me and, and like lockpicking lawyer and other people, like we just sit around and, and drink and pretend we're coming up with standards because the industry is not going to adopt them. Great Terrible. Great Terrible asks, do I ever see chub locks in the United States? And they even sent a photo. They sent a really cool photo of a lock that if I'm getting the Cyrillic correctly, um, I, I'm going to throw the photo on the screen, right? I think this would be pronounced Elbor. And I tried to have a little poke on the old Google. It looks like this would be uh, from Russia or the former Eastern Bloc. That word, Elbor, if I'm translating it right, it looks like Elbor references a super hard derivative of boron nitride. So apparently maybe this is a, it's like a trademark term that has to do with our locks are very hard. Uh, I don't know if, if they're actually making use of that compound or not. But um, this, is, this is, is a design that would represent what's called a lever lock. You're not seeing them at all uh, in the U.S. I mean, yes, they, they exist. I'm not saying lever locks don't exist at all. They exist on safe deposit boxes. Not, not made by the brand of Chubb, but Chubb is kind of like this term, like Kleenex. Like it, it, it's almost become generic in certain parts of the world to reference lever locks. Uh, Great Terrible, in fact, in, in his email, mentions uh, the Soviet and sort of Eastern Bloc region. That is where this key looks like it's from, so I think I'm on the right track when I try to hunt down information. Uh, no argument from me. They don't show up in the U.S., mostly because of a lot of market determinism. People in the U.S. are used to the keys they're used to seeing. They are used to a blade that has bitted teeth on the top, and it goes and it, you know... The idea of a big, chunky key with bits on both sides, people would kind of scratch their head and be like, oh, it looks different. I don't trust it. It's big. It's annoying. I don't want it on my key ring. In other parts of the world, people are used to a lot of different form factors of lock. 
uh, you're not gonna really you're not gonna really see um, this sort of Elbor system in the U.S. I think, uh, or anything like it in the U.S. I see uh, lever locks a lot in South America, Latin America. I see them in you know as as you mentioned, Eastern Europe. Uh, we see them in Poland occasionally. But by the way, um, I'm noticing in my notes, I think I found a really awesome YouTube video of someone using what are essentially, I would call them impressioning keys to attack this style of lock. And I'm going to drop that footage in the, in the video. And if it's the lock that I think it is, it may be the lock that you're referencing or a very similar design. And I love this. I love this impressioning based attack. So there you go. Continuing with locks and keys, Daniel J says that they were reading a steampunk work and this uh, work of fiction made mention of a key that would open all locks, quote, where the teeth would raise or lower based on inputs from a dial on the head of the key. Uh, I won't give away the ending that Daniel mentioned in his email to me, but uh, I love that. I love it's so cool. The reason it's so cool, that's not exactly real, but it's almost real. There is something called a makeup key. And as uh, you saw in some of the earlier uh, images, right, like lever locks, they're a long shaft and they have bit, uh, bits of different height at the end of the blade, right? Like there is a style of key where you could, it wasn't a dial, but it was a screw, usually a screw or a clamp. You could take off the tip of the key and then all of the bits were interchangeable parts, almost like a, a typist setting type from their drawer and they're using leading and packing it in. So, and they would lock it in okay, and, and make a, an old timey newspaper. Makeup keys. Once you knew the bidding of the key, and there's a lot of ways to try to figure out bidding either through smoking a blank or through a wax cast process. There's a lot of ways to try to attack lever locks. You could essentially on the fly with a field kit, uh, something you could have in your pocket almost if you're careful and don't spill it. You could make up a key lock it in place and then use it in that lock and the next lock and the next lock if they were all key to like. So uh, Daniel's story that you were reading, it's almost reality. That would be really cool. And I'd love to see that in a movie. I feel like if, uh, didn't League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, I think it kind of sucked as a movie. I never saw it. But if they ever made a sequel, I would love to see a dial based makeup key because that shit would look awesome on camera. Bryson A., Bryson A. asks, do I ever use super thin picks, uh, like 15,000th, let's say, picks? Um, no, I don't, because that is an incredibly soft touch kind of situation, which I definitely don't have. Um, I am not a soft touch. On my team, um, we have the scalpel. His name is Robert. I am the sledgehammer. Well, Bryson, I am not the absolute authority on picking, right? Like, I'm a competent lock picker, but I'm not the best lock picker. But I happen to know one of the best lock pickers. So what I did is I went ahead and I messaged uh, lock picking lawyer. And uh, he was very kind. Um, he's, he's a very giving and generous person with all of his knowledge online. And he's a good friend. He hangs out with us in Virginia. We're fortunate enough that our office in Fredericksburg is not too far away from him. It's like a day's drive. So we get to hang with him there. It's really cool to have him come around. And he, he weighed in on this. So uh, I have an answer about super thin picks. And I'm going to go ahead and far better than I could say it, I'm going to give it to you in his own words. Maybe I'll really give it to you in his own words. <clears> there <throat> we go. This is the lock picking lawyer, and that's a particularly difficult question to answer, Bryson. I used to use 15 thousandths picks far more often than I do now. Over the years, I've become far better at maneuvering thicker picks in tight places, so the thin ones don't come out as often. That said, thinner picks can be necessary in tighter keyways, or even if not strictly necessary, can make picking easier by permitting a more direct approach to the pins. Because of that, I like to keep a range of thicknesses in my bag. In fact, I think the foundation of a larger pick set should be identical 
short, medium, and deep hooks in different thicknesses, ultimately making for nine picks. If I had to estimate, I'd say I use 25 thousandths about 55% of the time, 18 thousandths about 35%, and 15 thousandths 10% of the time. Well, that's all I have for you on this question. If you do have anything to say, please let me know down below. If you liked this answer and would like to see more like it, please keep watching. And as always, have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs> Marvelous answer from a person far more experienced than, uh, than me. And I th I'm so appreciative of him for that. Braden C. Braden C. says, I love your talks. Thank you, Braden. That's cool. And now I'm addicted to pointing out flaws in every door I see. I totally do that too. Uh, walking down the streets is, yep, there's my wife saying, yes, he does that. He does that. So uh, walking down the street is hard with me sometimes. On dates. Yep, even on dates. Occasionally, like, someone will turn around, and I'm like, where's Devo? He's 18 paces back because I'm taking a picture of something that I want to show in a later video or a slides. Um, so Braden says, I point to your Shaka Khan talk all the time. Uh, awesome. I love Shaka Khan. It's a very cool event. If you don't get down to Hawaii too often, you might not be there, but a uh, very cool bunch of people, uh, Secure DNA and their whole team, like, they, they run it, and it's awesome. So he says, I haven't seen you talk about wall-mounted lock boxes with a keypad, uh, as opposed to the like Master Lock 5400 series with the multi wheels. I think Braden is talking about like Kitty, uh, the Kitty Access Point series of multiple, uh, you know, punch button keypads. So there are attacks against these boxes. Uh, they're very methodical, sort of probing-based attacks. Uh, Patrick McNeil, his name is Unregistered436 on Twitter, uh, he talks about some of the attacks that he has done against them. Uh, there's a number of, of sort of attacks against these little push-button key boxes, right? In general, I've never seen a push-button style key box that's great. So I've never really seen a good consumer-grade key storage box. They, they really just don't exist. Obviously, in the commercial world, you have Knox and Supra and some other brands offering rapid entry boxes where the master key for the building uh, is accessible to firefighting crews. Those have their own interesting problems uh, sometimes. But for the consumer world, if you really want to push buttons like way to get into a building, look into an electronic deadbolt. Look at, not all of them are good either, right? Uh, it's no secret, I've mentioned online occasionally, I like the Samsung series of products. They make an electronic uh, lever, you know, handle. They make an electronic deadbolt that's really cool. You might see it kind of make a little background appearance in a Modern Rogue episode in a bit. But yeah, uh, as far as key boxes go, they're, they're all crap. Logan F. Logan asks about traveling with our burglary tools, as we often do, right? We always have our lock picks on us. Have we ever been hassled? Um, you know, have we ever had a problem traveling with our lock picks and other lock tools? And Logan also says, thank you for the content. Uh, thank you, Logan, for watching. I appreciate it very much. And the short answer is no. We don't experience a lot of problems. Um, I tend to travel with lock picks on me all the time either in my wallet or my little golf bag set, as you've seen in a previous video, or just, you know, the multitude of stuff that's in our, like, luggage luggage all the time for jobs, right? So domestically, in the U.S., there's a map on the tool website. I will throw a little image on the video, and I'll also link it down below. Most places you can go in America are pretty safe as far as lockpicks are concerned. They're, they're legal almost everywhere. And even in the handful of states where there are concerns, uh, that would be Virginia, Mississippi, Ohio, and Nevada, big uh, Nevada, Las Vegas kind of state, right? Even those places, it's not like you get discovered with picks, you go to jail. That they're not illegal. You have to just, however, explain perhaps why you have them. 
it's kind of an end run around innocent until proven guilty. It's guilty until proven innocent. But if, you are, if you're a security professional, if you say, look, I do this for my job, here are my, here's my business card, I obviously work for this company, I'm not some fucking bozo, you're probably fine. Around the world, yeah. Um, we've, had, we've had a little static in Germany at some airports. We've had um, kind of a lot of static in Russia. Getting a lot in Russia, it's very common in posh sort of buildings for the building to have a security checkpoint like you would see in an airport. So private security forces are putting people through, you know, X-ray scanners and shit on the way in. Uh, so we've had to answer some questions there. And but again, like it's fucking Russia. So if you're connected, if you if you have a little bit of juice with whoever is hosting you, they get involved. They say a few words, and then you know you're fine. Hong Kong. Um, we had, we had this whole funny, uh, story about, um, Bobak tells the story better than I can. Maybe I'll throw a video of him telling the story later up, uh, in the channel. But Bobak tells the story when we transited through Hong Kong a couple of times, the, the reaction of the security force was both amusing and identical. Like every new shift, new crew, new day, but the identical interaction that he had with the security team. And it was very funny. There's kind of um, a parallel here, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on this, but it, there's a parallel with cannabis or even alcohol, and a lot of it has to do with privilege and posture and situation. Things can be illegal, but are they like illegal, or are you just maybe getting something confiscated? And someone who looks like me, someone who's white, someone who is male, someone who's very cis presenting, like, I don't look like much of a threat. I look like the norm. I look like I carry myself with kind of confidence and I have clearly, like, I have my act together. I have a lot of privilege. I'm not nervous around cops like a lot of other populations are. So if I get hassled for, why do you have this lock pick? It's probably gonna go the same way it would if a authority figure was saying, why do you have this bottle of bourbon? Or if they were like, what is this baggie of something in your, like, the worst case I'm probably facing is a situation where they're confiscating something and being like, get out of here. That's not going to go the same way for everyone. And that's the reality of the world. And that's fucking unfair. But have, I, you know, Logan asks, have I been hassled? Not too much. And some of that is because I know what I'm doing and I'm sensible about where I'm going, but some of that is also privilege and I have to be aware of that and we all have to be aware of that. Rob G. Uh, Rob G is an EMT. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, I get a lot of email from first responders. Rob G has the Sparrows EOD kit, which is a nice set. Big, I, I, you know, people bag on Sparrows gear and a lot of their stuff is kind of cheap. Uh, cheaper than the like the high end premium. They they Sparrows. Let's let's be clear. Sparrows specializes in seeing something popular in the market and saying we could make that at half the price and eighty percent the quality. And a lot of people are going to go for it for that reason because that's a smoking deal sometimes. Uh, so he has the EOD set, very cool. And Rob wonders uh, about adding anything to it that doesn't come by default. Uh, he asked specifically about my common keys, the deviant key ring, right? Um, yes, uh, I, I love adding a few keys. You can't just like bulk up your whole life with every key I've ever mentioned on a talk because then you're just the, the guy who's carrying 15 fucking keys around and like that doesn't, that doesn't make sense either. Uh, I will say the Sparrow's EOD set, I love that they're including kind of a mini knife type tool for decoding. Uh, that's something that's not covered enough in a lot of lockpick sets. Uh, I wonder how their tool is. I've never played with it. It looks interesting to me. I'll have to get my hands on one and, and see if it's... Because the, the, it's insidious, right? The, those tools, they have to be thin to work, but that means they're usually going to break eventually. I will say that my personal everyday kit, I carry uh, the American lock bypass driver for American padlocks. It works more than it doesn't. And I carry some key extractors, uh, not because I break a ton of keys all the time, but sometimes just getting crap out of locks uh, is useful to me. So I, 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 I showed the key extractors in an earlier video. It's the, the bland of high quality, that cheapo uh, set from overseas. 
Some key measuring gauges, they're always in my personal carry kit, but that starts to get a little beyond what you would probably need as a first responder. I use those on pen test jobs. When I find a key, I wanna quickly measure it, obviously, things like that. But honestly, um, something that not everyone has because it's bulky compared to the mini gym, it's thicker, but the, the traveler hook, man. First and foremost, I love my traveler hook. It's the first thing I grab on a lot of doors. It gets me through a lot of doors. I know that handle is a little bit chunky, but if you can pack one into your kit, keep a traveler hook on you. Lauren M asks, where did I obtain all my handcuffs from around the globe? Uh, well, I mean, the answer, right? The answer is from around the globe. Uh, that's not the, the, the complete answer. I, I do have a lot of travel that I've done in my life, and you see me all over at a lot of cons, and I've picked up a lot of handcuffs when I was traveling. But uh, Handcuff Warehouse, handcuffwarehouse.com, they're a website, they're a very cool company, and they have a lot of oddball handcuffs from a lot of places, and that, that was definitely an element of growing my handcuff collection. Uh, that and having friends, uh, having friends in a lot of weird places. So... Yeah, having friends around the world is just kind of enriches your life in a lot of ways, not just handcuff ways. Glitch Flux. Glitch Flux is a Pennsylvania-based lock picker asking about surplus gear. Uh, not like military surplus, but lock pick surplus, right? To, to start teaching others. Um, Glitch Flux wants to say, hey, I don't want to go out and buy hundreds of dollars of locks if there is surplus or use locks that I can use to build up a kit. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, please get in touch with Tool, Tool with three O's, as many of you know Tool by now from uh, my life with Tool. I'm still on the board of the Open Organization of Lock Pickers. Uh, Tool will reach out to and will try, we will always try to care package out to new emerging lock sport meetups. Uh, you can't just sort of like write in and be like, hi, I'm starting a meeting, help me out, give me free shit. But if you are in touch with us, if you, you know, you're, you're pinging us back and forth, maybe you join the Slack, maybe you jump on one of our uh, tool open meeting phone calls where a lot of chapters around the country talk, and you're like, look, this is us, you know us, we've been in uh, Tacoma for three weeks now, four weeks, we have our next meeting next month, and if we start to see some traction, we love the idea of kind of seeding new chapters with some gear. Uh, and we'll do what we can. And if you say you're in Pennsylvania, the long dormant chapter of the Philadelphia chapter of Tool is back. We're back, baby. Uh, I'm not in Philadelphia anymore. Well, I, I am now, but I don't live in Philadelphia anymore. Uh, Philadelphia has been a kind of a dormant chapter ever since Bobak and I moved away and Lady Merlin, uh, her duties take her all over the place. But Kai and a guy named Kai and some other people in Pennsylvania are getting that chapter restarted. So if you live uh, close to Philadelphia or you can get there, please reach out to us. There are going to be a bunch of people getting momentum going again, and we want to donate some gear and kind of keep that going. So definitely just send us a message. By all means, hit us up. All right, one more. One more lockpicking question. Plenty more questions on the sheets, but Matt S. A lot of Matts. If your name is Matt and you follow me on YouTube, be sure you have a, a unique last initial because there's a lot of you here. Matt S. says, thanks for all the knowledge and entertainment you've provided over the years. Thank you, Matt. It is my pleasure. Uh, thank all of you just for watching. I, I love doing this. It's really fun, and I appreciate you. Matt says, what are my, Deviants, tools for solving weird problems? Uh, Matt mentions things like uh, he keeps a spare phone, a ham radio, a soldering iron, an N95 uh, filtration mask, some stuff in his truck uh, for, like, Bad scenarios, like weird scenarios, shit that goes down. Uh, do I have any tools that go beyond just lock sport tools, um, sort of fix it rainy day tools? Yes, I do. Uh, there's, in fact, stuff that's in my truck. There's stuff that's in my tool bag, kind of in my luggage a lot of times when I travel. And it's such a great question. This gets its own Vigeo one day. I'm going to do nothing but a Matt S. inspired answer to this question and talk about some of the things that are in my everyday tool bag. I've done the green backpack video, my, my satchel bag. I've done the sort of package that's in my bottom of my luggage with my emergency clothes and things. This is worth it because now I do have a toolkit that lives in my luggage and comes with me all the time. 
and I promise that that's going to be a future video you can look out for. All right, next section, food, drink, and diets. So Jason B., Jason B., uh, who is not the only person to point this out, says, I look uh, trimmer these days. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. And if you, like, my videos online go back a ways. And, uh, I used to be a lot bigger. So you are not wrong. Um, I, I am appreciating that you pointed out. Uh, it, I do look trimmer. And he says, um, St. Jason says, sometimes you mention low carb or being sugar free. Uh, am I deviant? Am I doing keto? Uh, what about, you know, that sugar-free cheesecake that I mentioned in the, in, you know, the, the recipe, I was like, I'll give you a recipe one day, right? So here is the broad answer there that this could almost be its whole video, but I am not your authority on health. I used to be very fat. I've identified most of the circumstances that contributed to that. They were the, you know, the stuff you expect, Right. Idleness, um, eating too much, and eating shitty things. What has reversed that trend? Being more active, eating less, and eating smarter. Now, let's unpack that. I am not an exercise nut at all. Uh, my wife and I love to go out. We love to walk. We love to bike. We love to be active. Principally, most of my physical activity is a brain hack, not a body hack. I've been working out more. I really enjoy, uh, like any, you engage your major muscle groups. I don't care about like building muscle. I care about the fact that it's literally free fucking drugs. Uh, if I work out in the morning, I feel incredible north of the neck all day. It's just free endorphin. Like why would you turn serotonin down? As far as below the neckline, how have I gotten trimmer? Not putting as many calories into my body. Um, and that's like a blasé answer. Like it's a, there's a lot to unpack there. A lot of that has to do, for me, with a couple of things. People mentioned the low carb thing. Uh, do I do less carbs? Yes. Am I militant about it? Like do I do paleo or keto? No, I don't, I don't put myself into ketosis outright. My wife is much more keto than I am. Friends of ours, Snipe and Brady, also people in the hacker world who've done amazing things with getting more in shape as they've gotten older, they do hardcore keto kind of like living. A lot of our friends do. But for the most part, when I'm going low carb, I'm doing it in a way to avoid processed foods. Uh, the more processed your foods are, it's not that carbs are the enemy, although when I'm low carb, I feel a lot better, but processed food just makes it easy, too easy to cram a bunch of calories in you. You wind up putting more input in your face than you need because that's just the insidious nature of carbs and processed food. Uh, sugar, absolutely. I've noticed huge differences in my life by cutting sugar. Uh, my, I have cut sugar to the fucking bone. Um, I've, I've cut dessert out of my life. I don't, like, a lot of health foods actually have more sugar. Like, fat-free yogurt. Fat-free yogurt can fuck right off because it actually usually has more sugar than regular yogurt because a lot of fat-free things, you know, they, they can't make them with the flavor that they, people expect. So they pile a bunch of goddamn sugar in it, and it's fucking annoying. Uh, so I use uh, Splenda. My wife uses Stevia. I use anything to get sugar out of my life. That's been a big benefit to me. And again, like I'm using a lot of trendy words here. So if I were to say to you intermittent fasting, I sound like a Silicon Valley douche bro. And I don't religiously do intermittent fasting. But what I have done is I've dropped breakfast almost entirely from my life. Not because I think it is a magical health panacea. But by dropping one meal out of the day, I'm taking in less calories. And breakfast is the easiest meal for me to drop. It's the one I miss the least. Um, I just tell myself I'm not going to eat till noon. noon. Noon to seven is when I eat. And I don't tend to eat uh, beyond that. And that's okay. And I, well, what the hell time is it? It's like 1 a.m. here. 
um, let's, let's not be kidding ourselves. I'm eating, right? Like calories are in alcohol. And I don't do this usually. I actually um, try to cut my drinking, uh, cut, cut drinking beyond about 7 p.m. as well, which has be, been way harder than not eating after 7 p.m. But yeah, what it comes down to, a uh, caloric deficit. Calories in versus calories burned. And if you can burn calories with your base metabolic rate and you don't pile calories in you as much, either through eating less processed food, eating less sugar, cutting a meal, you know, there are a bunch of little uh, toggle switches. And I've played with all these toggle switches in my life, trying to find which ones work for me. Clearly, I've found some that work for me, not all of them yet. Uh, I'd like to be a little trimmer. My dad is uh, it's just amazing looking. My dad and his sister are both blessed with really good genetics and dedication uh, to the gym and to health. Uh, I'll get there. You know, I like, I like uh, living. I like being on the right side of the dirt. So I'm going to try to stick around a little longer. And this is all part of it. But don't be afraid to try something. Don't be afraid to try something and really commit to it hard for a couple of months and see how it leaves you feeling. Take notes, um, be honest with yourself, what works, what doesn't for you, and go from there. Hopefully um, hopefully all of us, there's a big push in the hacker world to be more healthy. Hopefully a lot more of us try to do it and we all wind up sticking around longer because the world, uh, you know, the world needs more hackers and we need to be healthier. The sugar-free cheesecake video, um, by the way, I, I'm just gonna make a whole video about it. Tara and I will do it. Um, it's not like sugar-free, right? Like a lot of the ingredients uh, in cheesecake have some natural sugars, but it's no sugar added. We don't use any like bag of sugar in the mix. That's coming up in a future video. Kate C says, what do I do with my sous vide cooker when I'm traveling to another country where they use 240 volt service? I don't bring it. Most modern consumer electronics will work just fine in 110 or 240, you know, volt countries, or 220, sorry, 240, no, 220 usually. Uh, 220 volt countries, 110 volt, like your laptop, your phone charges, all that shit. They're, they're all coming out of Taiwan or Korea or something nowadays. So all those electronics work just fine around the world. Something with a big honk and heating element, a hair curler, a uh, sous vide cooker, that kind of thing. I would not dance with the devil in the wrong uh, European plug outlets. Uh, that's, that's a recipe for letting the smoke out or making the hotel manager very angry at you. That's what I assume. I don't experiment with that. Matt D. Last one, the food and drink question. Matt D. says, do I have a favorite restaurant uh, or a favorite food and booze pairing? Yes, this is fun. I have... Uh, I have notes for you here because I can't keep all this in my head. But when I'm in Philadelphia, uh, when I'm back east here, uh, Village Whiskey is one of my favorite places in Philadelphia, not just for a drink, but um, for a bite. Village Whiskey is incredible. The Dandelion is also right near it in uh, not West Philly, but the west side of Center City. Uh, Dandelion's incredible. Down far to the east side, on the almost by the water, is Han Dynasty. If you like really genuine Szechuan food, uh, get yourself to Handy Nasty. Absolutely. Not a, not a bit of broccoli anywhere in that restaurant. It's, it's very genuine Chinese mainland food. Uh, where I live now in Seattle, uh, you've got the Heartwood, Heartwood Provisions. You've got Shuckers. Uh, you've got Ephesus. Uh, they're just, a, the, oh my God, the Turkish food at Ephesus is incredible. And when I'm in Vegas, right, uh, because we're always in Vegas all the time for hacker cons, uh, Binion's, Binion's Steakhouse, Joe, Binion's is in North Vegas, Old Vegas, um, Old Town Vegas. You've got Joe's, Joe's is in the Caesars Forum shops, and the Circus Circus has a steakhouse to die for. you notice all my things in Vegas are steakhouses, and uh, yes, because what the fuck are you doing if you're not eating good steak and cheap steak in Vegas? And the Circus Circus is the mind blower, the mind blower. Every review of that restaurant literally starts out with, yes, I know this is in the Circus Circus. Trust me on this. And then the, the review of like the restaurant, because it's fucking incredible. And you have to walk through the hellhole toilet that is the Circus Circus. Try it. As far as food and booze pairing, uh, twist answer for you. 
it doesn't matter if you're pairing food with booze or booze with food. What really matters is that you pair either of them uh, with good friends. If you have good friends and good people around you, you will have a greater experience than you could ever have alone. Unless you're super introverted, in which case, you know, spin up a Zoom meeting or a session of Skype or something and, and do like a group session where you all watch the same movie at the same time by hit and play and, and you chat about it and you're, you're drinking something or, you know. But just, um, yeah, have other people in your life. If you're eating a meal especially, it'll make you slow down. It'll make you savor it more, enjoy it more. And uh, sometimes, even if you're drinking too much, having friends around you, the right kind of friends, make you drink just a little bit less. All right, a couple of questions about the Modern Rogue and other YouTube collaborations, because, boy, howdy, have a number of people said, like, did I see you on that thing with the stuff? So Brian R., and Jason B. both asked variants of the question, you know, would you consider partnering with Modern Rogue like you did with Lockpicking Lawyer? And Jason said, did I see Brian Brushwood in a background of a video you did? Yes, you totally did. Um, it's not a secret at all. Uh, Brian and Jason are friends of ours. They're, they're very cool people. And uh, Bobak and I went down to Texas. We finally found the time because we're always freaking busy. They're busy. Everyone's goddamn busy. But we spent some time in Austin. We shot a lot of cool content with them. And as you've been seeing Lockpicking Lawyer, uh, they release their videos on a, on a staggered schedule so they don't bombard you with one person's content. You will, over the next couple months, probably expect to see Bobak and I doing some fun things on Modern Rogue. And I would definitely go back. I would go back in a heartbeat. We stayed, uh, you know, we stayed at their HQ because they've got amazing property. If you're not familiar... Uh, with Fran and Dan Keller, like the, during the 1980s, you know, the satanic panic about the daycares where people were uh, just convinced that like Satanists were taking over the daycares and all that shit. F the case of Fran and Dan Keller, their daycare in Texas. That's the property that Brian owns. I fucking stayed there. Like I was in the house. It's wild. It's, it's like being a part of history and walking around the, the, the buildings and grounds. He has this huge plot of land out there. It felt really cool. I love it. Uh, so yes, I would definitely go back. Expect me to be back again in the future. They're amazing people. We've already got ideas for other videos coming up. Uh, Matt F. asks, so yeah, like, what about in range and forgotten weapons? I've seen you on TFB. Uh, you'd have got Carl, Ian, and James, all the firearm people that you know. Do I have any plans to work with those guys again? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Carl, uh, Carl Casarda, Ian McCollum, like they're good friends. James, uh, you know, James Reeves from TFB. James is a good guy. We hang out with James whenever we're in uh, New Orleans. So yeah, absolutely. I would, it's, again, it's all comes down to time. Everyone's freaking busy. And I know like the internet lights up. It delights all of you when people collaborate and more channels should do that shit. In fact, when, again, I mentioned the channels I used to like, like when, um, Michael from Vsauce or Derek from Veritasium when they would show up on some of Hank Green's work or um, Destin from Smarter Every Day. He knows those cats and they would all hang out together and shoot videos. I Like the internet loves that shit. So people should do that more. And it all just comes down to finding the time because I travel everywhere constantly, but uh, not always for pleasure. It's usually for work and working with those cats, it's 100% pleasure. So I want to do that some more. Kate D. Kate D. says, would I ever collaborate with other YouTubers and who makes the list? So again, we're, we're touching on this again, but definitely I'm going to answer this by saying people I haven't gotten to work with yet. Uh, Destin is absolutely at the top of the list. Again, like I used to be in Huntsville all the time. I'm not down there anymore, but I would definitely go back. Like If you're watching this, fucking Destin's not watching my goddamn YouTube channel. Uh, I would be on Smarter every day. I would just hang out on set. I would just bullshit, let's cook some food. And I would, I would like help you film things just because I really respect the work you do and I love everything about your channel. Um, if I could ever like, you know, hang out with Derek uh, or Diana down in San Diego, sure, I would, I would hang out with y'all. Um, even to like Derek's old work where his early days of Veritasium was him doing the man on the street interviews where he would quiz people because his whole, if you're not familiar with Derek's work, um, his doctoral thesis was how people learn. 
and people learn more effectively if you give them a chance to be wrong. And he had this whole study where instead of just telling someone a fact, he would quiz them on a question and they would answer. And then he would say, well, this is actually the truth and you're wrong and here's why. And that reinforced, it made them learn better. So I love the idea of just sitting there and shooting the shit and letting him ask questions to me that I'm going to get wrong. And then I have the joy of learning how to be right. Uh, And by the way, like, you know, if... um, if I'm ever in California, like Snubs, I mentioned Snubsy, right? Tara and I know her and Hubs. Um, she does all kind of travel videos. She's definitely on the short list of people that I would travel anywhere in the world with. So maybe uh, Tara and I and she and Keith will like go somewhere. Um, yeah, just, just to hang out. I'd love to go to Japan uh, one more time with her. Uh, or in Texas, uh, in, in Dallas. If, if Mikey, uh, Mikey Newman, I mentioned Filmjoy, right? I would... Couches are couches where I work. Couches where I live and breathe. If I could be on the deep dive couch and watch a bad movie and find joy in it with him, that would be a very wonderful thing. So those are those are my sort of dream wish list collaborations on YouTube. Okay, we've got a lot more to get through. Not going to get through it all tonight for a variety of reasons that are manifold and interesting. I want to go to sleep. Yes, that that is part of the issue. But um, there are a number of questions about pen testing and what I'll call sort of career questions. I'm going to try to get through those because there's a lot of the same theme that kept repeating and it's very passionate that a lot of people have interest in this. So I wanna do that for you. And the rest of the questions that are on a number of fun topics about community and diversity and and other kind of hackerdom, we'll we'll get to those as best we can. Right now, pen testing and career. So, Tony. Tony asks, what got me interested in the career I have now? Did anything specific trigger me from general interest to professional endeavor? Uh, yeah, two, two real incidents would, would be what I, and I've told these stories occasionally in, in interviews and stuff before, but one, I can't give enough credit to Bobak. The idea of just showing up, being willing to show the hell up, makes such a difference in convincing people of things. And Bobak moved across the country. Uh, Bobak had this idea for a company, and he said, Hey, you know, I'm really serious about this. It's been a series of not false starts, but he had feelers out with some people who who took other jobs and wanted to do different things. And and that's okay. I mean, tech people get a lot of opportunities, right? But Bobak said, hey, you know, I like working with you. We, we bond really well. I got this idea. Let's do it. And he moved to Philly. Like he moved to the East Coast. And that was a big catalyzing event for me. Uh, we both had day jobs at the time. Like I was working at a school as a, their main technologist. Uh, he was working in tech consulting uh, for another major national firm. But just the fact that he moved, I wouldn't be where I am today if he hadn't done that. And it's amazing. As he just pulled up stuff, like he had, he owned a house in Iowa and he had to sell it later. Uh, it's incredible that he did what he did. As far as like a one snap kind of client event, I've told this story before too. Uh, I was, I had a technology consulting side hustle uh, where I was just, I was doing sysadmin stuff, right? And occasionally, a friend of a friend would say, hey, uh, you need such and such? Well, you got to call this guy. He can sort you out. So I got this call one day, and I was working at a, a school, as I said, but I got a call from a law firm. And the law firm said, hey, I understand that you're really good with tech and sometimes security sort of questions. And I was like, yeah, what do you need? Um, sometimes I'd configure routers or I would harden up uh, some, you know, some Windows environments. And I figured it was that. I figured they, had, uh, they were concerned about that whole hacker thing, which was new at the time, right? Because not everyone had everything on the internet. But I was like, oh, maybe they're putting their office, uh, you know, a little bit online. They've got a router now. Okay, what can I... And I was expecting it to be a standard consulting gig. And they said, well, here's what we got. Um, our sysadmin quit, and we need we need to we need you to come by. And I was like, oh, uh, when did they 
did they quit? Are you like, have you been hard up for a while? You, I was picturing a, a firm that, you know, they lost an employee and they realized that he did more than just make the printers get unfucked when the printers weren't printing. Oh, they must need a guy a few hours a week. And I was like, oh, when did, uh, when did your sysadmin quit? They're like, oh, like, like an hour ago. And I said, what, what, what happened? Like, oh, he like rage quit. Like he slammed the door and just let, said, fuck all of you. And just like peeled out the parking lot. We don't know if he's coming back, but we're a law firm. Like this, this doesn't fly here. We, we need to, we don't know anything about our computers and we don't have any, we don't have domain credentials. We don't have anything. We need to sort that out kind of like fast. And I said, okay. You know, I can, uh, cause again, I'm, I was a, I was a side gig consultant. I had, I was like in pajamas. It was like 11 AM, but I was like, oh, well I can, you know, I can move some meetings around and I, you know, I could probably be over there by 1230, you know, <laughs> so get in the shower, get in my truck, drive over cross town. And I show up, I'm like, Hey, um, you know, I'm like, yeah, nice to meet you, Eric. How's it going? Steve and Frank. All right. Uh, so what do we got? What are we doing? And there one guy, you know, Frank was like, okay, well sit here. Um, we got a locksmith on the way. Uh, we're going to get you in there. Here's what, ha- we don't have any root passwords. We need you to reset everything, uh, and give us control. We don't know if he has remote access. We don't know what's, I was like, yeah, I can do all that. No problem. I got you covered, man. It's no sweat. You got a windows environment, a Linux environment. What do you got? No sweat. And I'm sitting there. Uh, and this is like pre smartphone, right? Like I don't have Twitter. I'm just kind of sitting there. Uh, twiddling my thumbs in their waiting room, like looking at old magazines. And after 15, 20 minutes, uh, this dude, Frank, you know, walks me. He's like, you okay? Do you need a coffee or anything? Like, we'll get, we'll get you. I was like, Hey, you know, you say you have a locksmith coming. Like, can you show me the IT office? What are we talking about here? Like, show me what's going on. So, you know, cause I'm on the clock, like you're paying me. So he walks me down a hall and I'm like, this is the, this is it. Like, it's just, it's the same door as your other office doors. Do you, do you want me to try to just open it? You know, I mean, I probably could. He's like, you, you try that. And sure enough, like I, you know, I, I bent down, I use my picks for a second and it's not really happening, but I'm looking at the door. I'm like, wait a minute. And I say, can I, here, let me find a thing. And I grab, I'm improvising tools and like, boom, like I just shove, I I shove knife the door open. I'm like, okay, well, uh, okay. Cancel the locksmith. So we're good there. And I just, you know, fire up Pnordal, NT boot, and I'm like resetting servers. I'm like, okay, what do you want your root password to be? Okay, and I'm resetting that. I'm like, okay, your mail server. I don't see any RAS, uh, NAS accounts or remote access accounts. Uh, okay, like your RAS server is not running. Okay, okay, well here, right, put this in the safe. This is your new root password. This is your new domain. Okay, uh, you should be good. Uh, I'll check with you in like a week. Make sure nothing looks untoward, but you don't have, you know, RAS services running. You should be okay. And you know, the guy, he's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Root, yeah. Root password. Yeah. We'll, we'll take care of that. What'd you do to that door? And I'm like, oh yeah, your doors are kind of not fit right in this building. You should probably have someone look into that. And I'm still not getting the fact I'm not reading the customer correctly. Like his mind was nowhere on his files and his client data and his mail. Like he gave no shits about that. He was all about the doors. Until he finally, he's like, okay, yeah, hang on, hang on. Hey, Steve, Steve, get out. He calls a guy down the hall. He's like, could you show him what you did to that door? And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, your fucking door sucks. Like, you know, all the doors look like they're like this. I don't know why you installed them this way. And I'm still not grasping the idea that that was, that was like a market slice. So, yeah, eventually they turned into a much bigger client that we came back and we actually did a full physical eval on their office. And there was some word of mouth there. Uh, right around the same time, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Dark Tangent, who runs DEF CON, and he founded Black Hat, of course. Uh, so Jeff pinged me. Uh, this, is, this is way back around 2003, 2004. And he was like, hey, so you know, there's this thing we have called Black Hat. Um, we have these trainings. Would you ever want to do a lock picking training? And I was like, mm, I guess I could. And that's, that's all of this kind of came together. And it's just, it's just a lot of being in the right place at the right time. And it's that sort of magic, everyone has magic moments every day. What makes some people luckier than others is when they can notice it and when they can seize upon, 
seize upon it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's how all that happened. That's, that's what got me interested, and that's how my career took off, and here I am. So Jason from earlier, Jason from earlier has an amazing offspring, uh, JoLynn. JoLynn, am I saying that right, JoLynn? Because you had so many cool questions, and one of them was what inspired me to get my start, and how did I get my start? Uh, I touched on a lot of that in my last answer, but something that is key, you know, the, the, the real answer is like my hobby became my career, and it's always wonderful, the old kind of dumb sounding adage, uh, do, work with what you love and you'll never work a day in your life, right? Um, and that's not exactly true. Like, it's funny, it's insidious. Uh, my work becomes what I don't love. Like if, if I have to teach one more person basic, basic lockpick village lockpicking, I will shoot myself in the face because it's my job now. You know, it's not fun for me in the same way it used to be because it's now my career. And that takes a lot of the shine off it. But working, you know, JoLynn, I don't know how young you are, but teaching kids, I will still teach kids because I, I love the joy on their faces. But there's um, a very interesting point, and the reason I included this part of your question, specifically, how did my opportunity manifest into a real career? There is something known as the weak link theory. Um, much of society functions and flows because of weak links that we all have with others. It's not, you know, blasting your resume to a bunch of companies hoping someone's hiring. It's sort of the idea, uh, Mark Granovetter, as my wife is reminding me, Mark Granovetter is who advanced this theory. The idea that if you know someone, it's, it's the kind of thing where, you know, literally someone is uh, leaving their doctor's appointment and they hear the receptionist talking to another patient in the waiting room about leaf blowing and how no one does good leaf blowing. And he's like, actually, the guy I have for leaf blowing, like he and his wife have a good firm. You should call them. Like those kind of things are the weak links that actually cause careers to take off. And this is a theme that I will revisit for many of you who have asked questions about getting started in this career and developing a, my business. Getting yourself out there. You don't have to be friends with everyone in the world, but having a lot of little weak link connections to many people makes a huge difference in your world and sometimes in theirs. Uh, Matthew B. and a number of other people ask this sort of kind of question. Matthew B. says, I love the channel. Always excited to watch. Thank you, Matthew. You sound more excited than I am to even upload things because I never know how anyone's going to take any of my stuff when I upload it. Uh, but Matthew says, how did I get into pen testing? What did I do before? Uh, I've, I've addressed a lot of that. I was kind of in technology, but not in the, the pen testing world until magic but Matt says, um, where do I see myself in 10 years? That's a really cool question. Or not an interesting question, because I see myself fucking retired. I don't want to work any longer than I have to. There are some people, my wife is among them, who's like, I want to work till I'm dead. And I'm like, salute. Knock yourself out. I'm going to be reading by the fire. Um, I want to work hard, build a business that generates its own revenue, and then runs without me so that I have a bunch of money invested and I can live off my savings and not fucking work. Um, because I want to sleep till noon every day, eat good food, visit friends whenever I want to, any time of the day or month or year, and not have any strings attached to me. So that's, that's where I see myself in 10 years. Don't know if I'll get there. Who knows if YouTube will exist in 10 years? If it does, you can check in on me. GJ says, have I ever done work in the UK? How does it compare to the USA? Um, yes, is the short answer. We have some clients there. And the best answer I've got is that it's easier than work in Europe, but not as easy as work in the US. Um, the doors in the US, uh, a lot of things in the US. It's not that our doors are crap or our locks are crap. Our culture is different. Our culture and our standards of security are different. And our standards of security in Europe are different uh, by a different order of magnitude, right? And that a lot of this, as my buddy Robert in our company likes to say, um, the U.S. has never been occupied 
occupied by a hostile power, unless you count the current administration. Um, if you live in a country that's experienced true occupation, everything about your society focuses on security differently. Your doors, your walls, your locks, they're all held to a different standard. The U.S. has lived um, under threat from foreign power, but not the way the U.K. has. The U.K. has lived under threat of foreign invasion, but has never been invaded in the same way. And for that reason, locks are better, but not quite as uh, skookum as in Europe. <laughs>